talk, what is sugar addiction? Like, just talk to us about that. What, what exactly is a sugar addiction? Empowering you organically, delivering content you trust with results you love. Thanks everyone for listening. We are doing another episode of Empowering You Organically. I am joined by my co-host, Terry Ann Trevenin. Hey everyone. We also have our very special guest, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. Hi. And Terry Ann, give us a quick bio of Dr. Susan. Sure, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson lives in Rochester, New York with her husband and three beautiful daughters. She is a New York Times bestselling author for her book, Brightline Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin and Free. She's also the president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss. She is the founder and CEO of Brightline Eating, which is a company with unprecedented an unprecedented track record for helping people lose all of their excess weight and live in a right-sized body long-term. She has a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences, and she's been teaching at the university level for 13 years. She has been a professor of psychology of eating and neuroscience of food addiction. We could have just said you're really smart. <laughs> and that would have covered a, a okay, lot Okay, you want to hear something funny? <laughs> Do so it. I was on a Facebook Live and some guy was like, tell us again about how you have your PhD, please. <laughs> and that was when I realized there's a fine line between like stating your bio and trying to like, you know, have some authority or whatever and like going overboard with it so yeah, i'm really glad that you do the bios too because <laughs> that would sound a little weird coming out of my mouth for those of you who haven't listened to our first two episodes in season two make sure you listen we had dr susan on for both of those and we talked about just some really phenomenal information we talked about emotional eating and stuff that happens around the holidays um, our last episode we talked all about setting goals and bright line eating um, and really how to be successful um, this year with your weight loss or just getting healthy goals. Today, we are going to talk about a topic that is very important to me, and that's sugar addiction. And I think that a lot of people really suffer from it, whether they suffer from it on a very minor scale to a very major scale. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me personally, I one, I have a very big addiction uh, a very addictive personality to begin with, right? Yeah. We've talked about how I smoked for 20 years. I've had um, challenges at times with drinking, um, with other drugs, and just overall just addictive personality. One thing that I know that I'm addicted to, and that's sugar. There's no doubt about it. Um, I actually eat a ketogenic diet now because it really helps with that, because it minimizes how much sugar, minimizes all of that that I take. Because otherwise, I just enjoy it way too much. Yeah. So what is sugar addiction? Like, just talk to us about that. What, what exactly is a sugar addiction? And let's define sugars as well. Yeah. Right? It's, it's something with a keto diet. And people say, well, I don't eat carbs. Well, why not? Like, vegetables are carbs. You should be eating those. And, and people mistaken sugar and carbs and all of that. So let's start with identifying sugars. Okay, sure. And I love how you just kind of use that word carb and sort of, you know, there's a little eye rolling, right, with the whole word carbs because right. it's an unhelpful word. And Jonathan, you and I have talked about this before. Um, I hate the word carbs, actually. There's two words that I've identified that I have a little, I don't like those words, uh, diet and carbs. Yep. And and they're unhelpful words for the same reason. They... Um, okay, I'm gonna use a fancy term. They obfuscate the meaningful distinctions. Like they cloud the issue. They don't help. And so as soon as you're using the word carb, you, you're you not thinking clearly about what matters and what doesn't matter, right? Because the issue is not carbohydrate as a macronutrient. The issue is really food quality, food source. Um, and uh, yeah, you wanna be eating certain things that would be in the carbohydrate category. You wanna be eating apples and spinach and carrots and things like that. And you don't want to be eating donuts and bagels, you know, and tons of pasta, right? There, so there's, um, you know, using the word carb isn't helpful. I think when most people say carb, they mean like bread or something like that, right? Um, but uh, the real issue with bread is the flour. It's the grinding down of the, of the particle um, so that the digestive enzymes hit um, every sort of surface area of that molecule really hard and it absorbs into your bloodstream really fast and then it causes a big dopamine rush in your addictive centers and so forth. So when I talk about sugar, Jonathan, what I mean is anything added to your food to make it sweeter. And so that lumps into the same category on purpose 
uh, things as disparate as um, high fructose corn syrup, table sugar, honey, molasses, stevia, and then all of the artificial sweeteners, aspartame, sucralose, uh, all of them. The stevia, sweet stevia, erythritol, even, even the ones them. that have a, a no glycemic index response, right? Like yes. the stevia and erythritol. Anything that's sweet to the tongue. Yes, correct? exactly. Other than whole fresh real fruit. Okay. So whole fresh real fruit, it's got to be fresh and it's got to be whole, is fine. Um, but fruit juice is not and dried fruit is not. Um, so, you know, you got to kind of draw the line somewhere and that's where the line goes. Now, the reason that like stevia and stuff like that, things that don't have a blood sugar response are out is that, um, one of the major pathways for sugar addiction is actually from the sweet taste buds themselves straight up to the addictive centers of the brain. So you don't want to be adding anything to your food to make it sweeter. Uh, yeah, that's it. So when, when you say what's sugar addiction, should we go there? Like, what Absolutely. is it? Absolutely. So I'm kind of laughing in my head. It's like sugar addiction is sugar addiction. It's sort of like you asked, what's cocaine addiction? Well, it's addiction to cocaine. So um, it, sugar addiction in the brain is the same as any other addiction. It's um, essentially dopamine downregulation in the addictive centers, ma mainly the nucleus accumbens. So the addictive centers are like the, these areas in the brain. You've got the ved ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens and uh, this sort of area. It's, it's a deep primal primitive area of the brain. Sort of if you think of your head as a cue ball or whatever, it's like it's almost right in the middle. It's like if you, if you ca carry your neck up, like your spine up that, then you get to the brain stem and then just a little bit above that, like an inch or two right above that, right in the core of your brain. We're talking super old, super primitive areas. And their job is to give you enough oomph to get up and get what you need to get to survive. It's like, yeah, sex, food. We got to get us some of that. Otherwise, we're just not living long enough to sort of stick around around here and let alone have children, right? And pass on our genes. And so there are certain things that are so necessary that it is incredibly um, required that our brain makes sure that we identify um, the availability when it's around and we feel motivated to go get it. And um, sugar addiction is like pornography addiction in the sense that it's, it's sort of um, become really widespread because we have substances in our environment that were manufactured to really hijack those brain centers like donuts like there's no such thing out in the savannah right there is no such stimulus it's kind of like a loop of pornography right like there's no access to any kind of stimuli that's that intense out in natural conditions and they were sort of manufactured in order to like be pleasurable to a certain degree and what it does is it floods those centers of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, especially with excess dopamine. The dopamine uh, centers respond by downregulating, like thinning out. And then uh, you're fine because your brain's now responding more normally because there's fewer receptors and they're not responding as well. If you keep eating donuts, now everything's leveled out. But if you stop eating donuts, you got a problem. Now you, you have not enough dopamine on board and you're addicted. You've got to go get another hit to feel normal. So that's essentially what sugar addiction is. It looks on a brain scan. It looks the same as cocaine addiction, alcohol addiction. Uh, it actually looks a little worse to be honest. What does it look, what does it look like coming off of the sugar? Just like other things that you're addicted to in the brain. Um, so if you look at a PET scan or an fMRI, um, and you look at those areas of the brain, sort of the way those scans look is they usually use sort of, um, a scale, a color scale from blue to green to yellow, to orange, to red, where like the centers light up orange and red when they're really on fire. Mm -hmm. um, a normal brain to normal stimuli will have some orange and red in the nucleus accumbens. Um, a drug addicted brain or a sugar addicted brain won't. Like those dopamine receptors have been blown out. So you just don't see much response there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what they look like. They look bleak. So, We've identified kind of sugars and, and we talk about sugar addiction because I personally feel like breads fit inside of that for me. Yeah. 
right? As I'm coming down off of my yep. sugar high, I can eat a handful of rolls, you know, with butter on them and, and get that same, <laughs> totally. you know, that, that, that'll that, do. <laughs> right? yep, totally. That's a really important point. Cause, um, I've experienced this from 20, five years now essentially of um being in the weight loss sort of food addiction sort of space um people who don't give up flour don't succeed yeah. you can give up sugar but you got to give up flour too and if you don't think you have a problem with breads and pastas and those types of foods wait till you give up sugar and you'll develop one because the brain will take it as a substitute for sure share what you shared in the first podcast we did about why on like different flours you even said coconut an almond why yeah. do you say no to it what yeah. was you know I could say it but I'll let you say all it. flour yeah it's all flour. So, so it's not an issue of is it whole grain or not I'm not I know that whole grain flour is healthier it's got more nutrients more fiber than white flour but that's not the issue the issue is the grinding down and I'll actually share something that I didn't share in the first podcast brand new um it's a it's a concept from Dr. Alan Christensen, who's a good friend of mine. And he said, you know, the way he describes this to his patients is the difference between a whole food like rice, for example, and a flour like rice flour uh, from a metabolic standpoint is the difference between on a hot summer day in Arizona, taking a big brick of ice, like a, a one foot square brick, big brick of ice and putting it out on the blacktop on the driveway to melt. It'll melt, it'll take a few hours though, versus taking snow cone shavings, little shavings of ice and sprinkling them on the blacktop. Well, they melt on contact, right? That's what flour is, is sprinkling snow cone shavings into the digestive system and it just absorbs like that and you get the full force of the glucose, the fructose, whatever's in that, hits the digestive system all at once. So it's not an issue of gluten or any particular substance. It doesn't matter if it's coconut flour, almond flour, whole grain flour, gluten-free flour, rice flour, even potato flour, flour, even, even it... almond flour. Yes, it's a matter of surface area and digestive impact. It's the processing of it that matters. Almonds are fine, rice is fine. It's like, okay, so here's, here's the best way of thinking about it. What is a drug? So Jonathan, I don't, we, we've danced around the issue. I have a, I have a drug addiction background. You've mentioned like, ah, oh, whatever, alcohol, drugs, whatever in the past, right? <laughs> what is cocaine, Jonathan? Pop quiz. <laughs> what is cocaine? It well, comes I mean, it, from where? It comes from the coke, uh, from the cocaina plant. The coca, yeah, yeah coca the plant. coca leaf, right? I lived in Panama, so yeah. we call it cocaina down there. So oh, yeah. so you're, you're, you're like in the natural language. <laughs> right? you're, like, you're like three steps ahead of me, okay. <laughs> So um, it's like, a, what is it? Have you seen it? What does it look like? I've never seen it live. I, have, I like haven't seen it grown. I did not go down or... into Columbia. I okay. was going to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it looks like a regular plant. It's just a, a simple, it's the leaf that yeah. they grind down and they dehydrate, turn into a powder. By the time we get it, it's been cut with all kinds of other stuff. Right. Because pure yeah. cocaine. And, yeah. yeah. So there's a scientific journal article that's been published that showed that um, chewing coca leaves is not addictive. They put them in their cheek there, the hikers in the Andes Mountains. Yep. It's not addictive, apparently. Like, it'll make your cheek a little tiny bit numb. And it, I think it definitely it gives, gives you, a, you energy. Gives you a little bit of a lift, sure. maybe like the equivalent of drinking half a cup of caffeinated tea or something, right? Nobody's breaking into their grandmother's house to steal a VCR to get more coca leaves. Like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's not addictive, but you take the VCR. Inner... <laughs> I like that you said VCR, yeah, right? right? Did, that, did that just show I'm our so age dating when myself. you said VCR? I know, I know how how old you are too. I was just looking on your wall, like your your little thing that had your dad. I won't say your birthday, but I saw it over there. No worries. I just turned 40. I have oh. no problem sharing. Nice. I'm 44, so I'm your Perfect. elder. I Got please, it. please act accordingly. I will. Lots of respect. Um, don't steal my VCR. Just saying. <laughs> okay. So, so back to the point. So um, drugs come from plants that have been modified in a certain way, right? Cocaine comes from taking those coca leaves, which are not addictive, taking the inner essence and then refining and purifying it into a fine powder, right? Heroin comes from poppies and you can eat poppies, sit in a field of poppies and eat them all day long and not get high and not get addicted. You get the substance in your bloodstream, like you will fail a, a, a urine test for opium 
Like you will fail a drug test if you have eaten a bunch of poppies recently. Sure. But you didn't get high off it and you didn't get addicted. But if you take the inner essence of those poppies and you refine and purify that into a fine brown powder, you get heroin, right? So what we're doing in our food supply these days is we're taking these plants, we're taking wheat, we're taking beets, we're taking corn, all wholesome, real foods, and we're taking the inner essence and then refining and purifying it down into fine white powders. And we're taking foods and turning them into drugs. Research shows, according to some estimates, that sugar is eight times as addictive as cocaine. Eight times. You want to know the study that that one comes from? Go for it. Eight times. Just in case you want to know how screwed you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. That's amazing. Uh, said from one sugar addict to another. I'm not, I'm not putting you in any uh, cage that I'm not in myself. Okay. Um, so they, so this study, um, was done with rodents and they took rats and they, uh, injected them with intravenous cocaine over and over and over again until they were quivering cocaine addicts. And then they didn't give them a hit for a few hours. So they wanted one. And then they give them, they gave them a choice between another hit of cocaine, which they were already addicted to and some sugar, which they'd never had exposure to before cocaine or sugar. And they chose the sugar. Not only did they choose the sugar, but when they redid the experiment with um, saccharin, sweet and low, the, the pink packets, they preferred that too. Wow. Over cocaine that they were already addicted to, already physiologically needed in their system. Um, and based on the strength of that response and, you know, some other things based on like how much shock organisms will withstand to get another hit. Like literally they put the little trough, the dispenser over an electrocuted grid and you like turn up the voltage to see how much shock will they withstand to get a hit. You can kind of measure addictiveness that way too. Yeah. Sugar, sugar is like to put it in the category of cocaine and heroin is not only appropriate, it's scientifically true. It just is. Sugar is right up there in terms of drug strength with heroin and cocaine and way beyond cigarettes, by the way, Mr. Former Smoker. Yeah. Way beyond cigarettes. Yeah. Way. Well, and we put sugar in everything now. I mean, the, the, yeah. sugar, I mean, the, the, the fat-free <laughs> movement, right, that came in the late the 80s. 70s, early yeah. 80s, right? And we replaced all of the fats with sugars. Yep. And so I think there's a lot of people addicted to sugar that don't even realize or don't even identify that they're addicted yep. to sugar. You know? Yeah, but I, invite them to quit and they'll see. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's like, my whoa. exact point. Yeah. Well, and it's hard How many to, kids are addicted to sugar? Because sugar is in everything. It is, it's hard. Like you read labels now and people think they're not getting sugar in certain foods. But they are. But they are. They don't 80%, know. They 80% don't even know. of the calories in the modern day supermarket are laced with added sugar. 80%. Yeah. 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 So I have a question for you. Earlier you talked about, not in this episode, but in the first episode we did with you about um, stevia, erythritol, things like that. And that's that's still a no-no, even though it's you know natural, yep. not considered sugar yep. by a lot of people. Why is that a no? Can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, because um, it's the extra sweet taste on the taste buds that connects directly to the addictive centers of the brain that releases that dopamine hit. So if you want your brain to heal, you got to stop putting the sweet taste on your tongue. Hmm. You know, when I was quitting smoking, I had a lot of people say, well, why don't you smoke an e-cig or why don't you smoke a joint or do something like that? Just the motion of inhaling something yeah. would have triggered me. Yep. And I don't know that it's the same. But yep. I can I can I can relate it to that right yep. that why, why I can't do anything that's yeah. even remotely similar to other than inhaling oxygen right yeah. but anything that felt like taking a hit of something would have instantly wanted, yeah. made me want to smoke again and here's um, okay <clears throat> now we're gonna maybe wander off into some pretty deep research but here's what makes me and you Jonathan different from Terry Ann we're addictive addictable heavily Terry Ann are you addicted to anything or are you kind of like you run on moderation naturally. Oh no, I have some things in my life. You have some things? But I'm I work. <laughs> She's addicted to work, work. there's no doubt. Okay. For sure. Yeah, there's definitely things. Okay. I don't like to necessarily control other people, but I like a lot of control over my life. I would probably 
to the point that it's an addiction of okay. control in my life. Things just so things a certain way. I could care less if your house looks just so, or and it's not so much about keeping up with people. It's a feeling for me of a just of everything OCD. being like yeah. yeah yeah yeah, and just be everything being just so for me. Yeah. I don't care for you. I don't care for him. I don't care you know what Travis's house looks like or Alan's house looks like. Is but it I a care problem? What looks like do you do it to the point where you're hurting yourself? No. No, it, yeah. it, it, there's been points in my life where, yes, it did. It was like I would do things just so that it was. Because this know, is a separate topic now, but like uh, the whole thing of like everyone's addicted to something yeah. or like every sort of ec- excess is an addiction. I take issue with that. Like I have been really addicted to things like sitting in a crack house for days upon days smoking. Yeah. Yep. And um, I sort of feel like unless you're harming yourself, knowing that you shouldn't be, wishing you were doing it differently with tears streaming down your face saying, why am I doing this to myself? Yep. Like that's addiction. Oh, like I'm sure. doing there, it and, and there I can't were, stop. There were points in my life, especially when hard things were going on, that the control was so strong that it was like, why do I have to do this all yeah, the time? That's but I, it. But yeah. It's it's interesting when you talked in a previous episode about getting to a point where it's a lifestyle and you get control over things like that and you realize like it doesn't have to be this way mm-hmm. and you get past that. So it was definitely something, you know, that happened previously when there was a lot of stress in my life but gaining control over that mm-hmm. again. So I'm definitely when you talk control about your quiz, I'm not a 10 on the quiz, but I've yeah. certainly had things in my life where I could fall yeah. back into that super easy if my life got stressful again and okay. that's a control thing for me like everything being just so and feeling like I'm I'm stressed and my life feels stressful and my emotions feel chaotic if everything's not just so. It's yeah. it can be crippling for yeah. me. Yeah. Totally. I get it. Okay. Yeah. So, um Jonathan and I are super addictable. You're either low or moderate. Yep. Okay. For sure. So, what what's different about how our brains work, right? What makes someone addictable? Um there's like to party. Oh, no, sorry, I, I didn't know that was a, that was a rhetorical well, question. Well, yeah. <laughs> Party with donuts if we're talking about sugar. We would have had fun back in the day. Just <laughs> right. saying. Just yeah. saying. This back is 15 in the years day. ago for me, too. So, yes, I'm with you. Um, so what makes, what makes our brains different turns out to um, be this interesting thing. Um, researchers back in the day... We're doing basic behavioral experiments with rats in Skinner boxes. So, you know, just basically the rat presses the lever, they get food, right? And there are all like a million variants of this experiment. And um, they tried this experiment where um, a lever came down into the cage, like it just came down in there. And then three seconds later, food came out into a dish. And the rats pick this up super fast. Lever comes down, food's coming out. You know, they're quick on that one easy what researchers didn't expect is that when the lever came down some rats ran right over to the food cage the food dish area which made sense they just sit there for the three seconds wait for the food to come out but some rats ran over to the lever and like nuzzled it rubbed up against it like they loved the lever And researchers were like, why are they loving on the lever? Like, it's the cue that the food is coming. But don't they just want the food? Like, what? why are they loving the lever for its own sake, right? And so they started doing some variants where, like, um, they would only let the food come out for a hot second, and then they'd suck it back up. And some of the rats would love the lever so much they'd actually miss the food. Like they'd miss the whole point because they were so into the lever, right? So it turns out that addictable rats are the ones who love the lever. And the non-addictable rats are the ones who like run right over to the food and go, oh, like there's the cue that the food is there. I'm going to go get the food. They're the sensible ones. They're like, yep, waiting for the food. The addictive ones are the ones who are loving the lever. So, so, okay. So what? The lever is the cue that the reward is coming. And the rats were pulled, pulled toward that cue, almost to their own detriment, to the point where they would even miss their sustenance to be pulled toward that cue. Now think about what it means in this society to be pulled toward the cues that predict food rewards. Let's say sugar rewards, right? If you're pulled 
strongly, maybe even unconsciously toward golden arches when you see them in the corner of your eye, like all of a sudden your car is driving that way. If you're walking down the hall of your school because you're a teacher and you catch a little glimpse of a Dunkin' Donuts box, that pink box through the window of the teacher's lounge, and suddenly you're pulled in that direction and your friends are talking and you're like, oh, and now you have a donut in your hand. You don't even know how it happened. If it's Friday night and you're pulled toward the bar where the wings and the beer and the nachos are happening because it's a certain time of day. If you're driving to work and you're pulled toward the Starbucks and suddenly you've got a latte and a muffin in your hands, you can picture it, right? Like our society is one long stretch of food cues, time of day, smell, sights, TV commercials, you know, on and on and on. And if those cues themselves pull you with a force that's magnetic, imagine the job of like, of getting over sugar, sugar addiction, of losing weight. When it's not just that you got to like eat fewer calories, you got to like, you know, get your, it's like, well, you got to break all of those associations. It's like a massive job, right? So when you talk, Jonathan, about being really cognizant when you quit smoking of like, I'm not hanging out with people who smoke and I'm not going to put myself at a, at a party on a Friday night. Like I just, I'm, I'm going to stay home. Right. Um, you were aware of like all the different cues that might undo you because they pull you harder than they pull other people, those cues. Right. So that's a little bit about what it is to be addictable. You're pulled toward the cues to a degree that other people are not. Absolutely. Yeah. And I agree with you. And, and, and it still goes back. I mean, it's, it's amazing as others that listen to this, take that journey to break that sugar addiction of the challenge that they have ahead of them, right? It's eight times more addictive than cocaine. You talk about, I mean, we, um, I think about, you know, the holidays and I think about having a cheat day on Christmas, right? Just calling it a cheat day and having sugar and candy with my daughters and, and just kind of having that whole quote unquote fun day. And then the next day there being some of those treats left over, but yet I want to go back to eating a, a ketogenic style way of eating, which is what I prefer. Um, but all I see is an M&M &M bag over here, you know, a little chocolate thing there, some little thing there. I mean, it's, it's like, that's what I see. And it's like, you know, you almost want to, you just got to throw it all out or do something. Did you eat right? them the day after? No, no. And how did you not? Uh, well, that's willpower, but if they were there every day, it would be different. Uh -huh. So I don't keep a lot of that stuff in the house, but I do still keep things. What I don't keep is like my weaknesses in the house as uh -huh. much. I, um, sort of think of, uh, our, ourselves as we embark on this breaking the sugar addiction journey as like having parts. And one of the parts is definitely the saboteur who whispers, you know, just a little, it won't, you know, it, it, let's time for a cheat day. You deserve it. It's been a long week. It's your daughter's birthday. The, the, just whatever the whispers are. Right. And the first thing that the saboteur is going to whisper is you can't do that forever. That's unrealistic. There's no way. Think, what about this event? What about this occasion? And it's, it's basically like, um, it's the most rudimentary, uh, move of the saboteur. It's like the first move. And so many of us fall for it. Right. And we forget that the world doesn't show life doesn't show up as forevers. Life always shows up as today. There is no such thing as all those days in the future that they, they, when we get there, it will be today. So all you need is a plan for handling today. You don't need a plan for handling all of the infinities into the future. Like you will do just fine if all you have is a plan for today. So the one day at a time thing, as trite as it sounds, and the saboteur will say, oh, that's some slogan, one day at a time. What the f does that mean? Come on. Like you're never going to not have any cookies ever. Come and it just goes right back into future tripping. But actually, the truth is you can have the cookie tomorrow, Jonathan. You can have the gum in the future and you can eat whatever you want at your daughter's wedding. You just can't eat sugar today. Right. right. <laughs> you give me today, I'll give you all those future days. Sure. Right? How's that for a trade? <laughs> and it's true. Like, listen, I, I get it from an intellectual side as well because smoking there's no way in the world right now that i would have a cigarette next week 
because it's been a couple months since I've had a cigarette. I mean, it's been yeah. over four and a half years. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's just saying goodbye. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's saying goodbye to, and that's the thing with addiction, right? Whether it's cigarettes or sugar or Coke or heroin or something like that. I mean, that's a friend. That's something that, that, that's been there with you that we usually turn to at bad times, but we also turn to, to, to good times. Oh, it's and the we same celebrate with, sugar. with food brilliantly, right? right? And like so big time. That's the, and that's the thing I think a lot of people don't grasp if they haven't been addicted to smoking. And I don't think a lot of people that are addicted to sugar, which I think a lot are, have not identified the fact that like you're saying goodbye to a friend. Yeah. And that's what you need to do is say goodbye to that friend. There are layers to that grief too. It's really important to honor that. And like for a lot of us, food has been almost like a lover, you know, like, um, for sure. I was a, I was an only child, um, raised in San Francisco by hippie parents who, you know, um, you would love this story, Jonathan. My parents were, they met in a hippie commune and, uh, they were on acid <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and they bought a motorcycle and started traveling around the world. And I was conceived somewhere in Costa Rica and they kept going. So my mom was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They got down to Argentina, southern tip of Argentina. They hawked the bike for plane fare back to the States. So anyway, I was born in San Francisco, only child. And um, my parents got divorced. And then my mom settled just a couple blocks, a few blocks away from Castro Street. So very gay neighborhood, uh, 1970s, 1980s. There were no kids in our neighborhood because it was before a time when gay couples could adopt kids, right? So I was the only kid in my neighborhood that I knew of. Um, and, um, there was a sadness in the neighborhood cause my neighbors were dying of AIDS. Um, they were dropping like flies, like, um, and, um, I went to a school way across town on scholarship, but I was, since I was a white kid, no one knew I, I was on scholarship, but I didn't really fit in. They were rich and two parents in the house and very leave it to beavery. And, um, and my parents worked hard. My dad was a cab driver. Um, my mom ran this little shop in Fisherman's Wharf and worked long hours. And I was a latchkey kid. I was home alone after school every day. So I was by myself in a neighborhood with no kids on streets that weren't safe to be out on. So I was just in the flat in San Francisco and I turned to food. Like food was th my companion. It was my friend. It was the activity. It, it was what I was doing was making food. I could have made you Thanksgiving dinner when I was 10 years old, like with all the trimmings, every dish arriving to the table at the right time. Um, I could bake pies. I could bake cookies. I could bake everything. Um, food was um, what got me through my childhood, right? So when people say like it's hard to think about life without certain foods, for some of us, foods are so woven into our identity. I mean, I know there's people listening to this podcast that are like, but you don't understand, I, I bake, right? Like, or I'm the person who brings the dishes to the potluck. It's like my most- It's their identity, uh, it's, yeah, it's who they are. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So there is a grieving process of letting go of using food. And that, I mean, I go over to some people's houses and they've got like cookbooks lining you know, like floor to ceiling cookbooks. And it's like, it's food porn, right? But it's, it's, but I don't, I also don't want to paint it as just a bad thing for some people. It's their creative outlet, right? Sure. So it's, um, it, there are layers to that grief and that letting go. And I, you know, I don't bake anymore. I don't. And it's, you know, I've learned to be creative in other ways, but just in the same way that you, you know, had to make certain changes when you became a non-smoker, I had to make certain changes we, when I became a thin woman, you know, like I, I orient toward food differently and I don't, um, you know, I've just changed, you know, like, and we'll replace it with other things, right? I mean, you, yeah. you replace it with stuff that's healthier, that's better, right? The smoking yeah. got replaced with other things, yep. right? Or whatever it is. Totally. Totally. I have a question for you, Jonathan. Yes. Have you been intrigued by Bright Line Eating? Have you thought about trying it? Um, what do you Absolutely. I mean, since we've been doing more podcasts and, and getting to know you more, I'm absolutely intrigued, right? Mm -hmm. And I want, I want to dive deeper. I mean, I just like, uh, we had you on the show, right? I, there's a lot of things we do selfishly. We started Organics, a supplement company, so that we would have the best supplements because I wanted to take them and I wanted my family to take them, <laughs> right? We wanted the best yeah. supplements that were out there. And so that was that's why we started a supplement company. Um, it's why we're doing a podcast and why we're having experts like you on is because we want the best information from the best experts when it comes mm -hmm. to things. And so it's, it's something I was so excited about having you here 
for the new year and to talk about sugar addiction and to talk about eating and talk about our relationships to food and all of that for selfish reasons, knowing that if I did that, just like our supplements, I would help hundreds of thousands of other people. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. So what do you think bright line eating might, uh, bring into your world or give you that you don't have now? More structure around the, the eating yeah. and, and yeah, more structure. Totally. That's, that's a way that bright line eating helps a lot of people. There's so much confusion out there about what to eat and when, and you're busy. Like you're a high functioning, like, uh, get it done, dude. Right. Like right. you got a lot going on yep. and to have the food nailed down, like done, handled, right? Like that feeling of like days are ticking by and you're like, food, check. You're like, ain't no thing, right? We're not like, and and to have that bar set so that you know where you are with respect to it. Not to say that every day you hit the bar, but the bar is set really clearly. And if you slide off track, you know exactly how. You can look back and figure out why, and you know exactly the tweaks to make to get it back, right? Where there's that level of precision and clarity. You probably have that precision and clarity in other areas of your life, sure. right? Where you know exactly what you're well, trying to hit. T take out the um, the guesswork mm -hmm. too, right? Like it's just what it is. You know, look at my closet. Work. Every shirt in my closet is black, right? I don't have to think about what I'm wearing today. It's going to be a black <laughs> shirt, right? I know that. Right? A black totally. shirt, neither khaki shorts or jeans. And that's, there you go. I'm being dead serious. That's what I have in my closet. It's the Barack it's, Obama getting dressed approach. It's just these decisions that you don't yep. want to have to make exactly. every time. Why don't I just have something that's done and set? Yep. And yeah, bright line eating is that for food. Absolutely. And we were talking at the break here, uh, you know, just before the, the podcast happened, we were just chilling out and we, I was in your kitchen and you're like, oh, you're weighing your food and da da da. And I was telling you, like, I like to weigh 112 pounds, right? And I like, if I'm not 112 pounds, I like to make a tweak and get right back there, right? Like there is something so special for a woman like me who just struggled with her weight her whole life. Like, you know, I, I, there are no words for how much I've struggled with my weight. There are no words. And to, to be able to just dial it in like that, like food, weight, handled not a problem. And then with it, of course, comes the self-confidence and the mental clarity and the, the lift in the mood that comes from eating, you know, the way we eat when we're eating well. And, uh, I mean, it's just, there's a million and one reasons to do it, you know, and then, um, and then the ability to do it because bright line eating sort of provides the automaticity that makes it feel really free and easy and automatic and handled. So with that said, I know we're getting close to the end. I've got to ask this question because, again, I'm selfish and it's relevant to me because I have a two-year-old <laughs> and four-year-old daughter yeah. who love, you know, the the organic lollipops in the yep. pantry right now. Yeah. How are you with your three daughters yep. when it comes to sugar and bread and eating? Yeah. Okay. So um, I feel like Bright Line Eating is... Um, not for all the people who need it. It's for people who want it and are willing to work it. And that means grownups who are making their own choices. Um, it is not something for parents to force down their kids' throats. And there's um, a problem with forcing our kids to eat a certain kind of um, way if we're living in this society. So you want to take your kids to some rural mountain commune in Oregon where all they got is tofu and kale around and that's all they're going to be exposed to, then great, feed your kids tofu and kale for the rest of their lives. But if you're going to live here in this society, you cannot turn food into the forbidden fruit because you will turn your kids into sneak eaters who hate you and are craving every calorie outside the house because the food mommy the and daddy could... house and raid the pantry exactly yeah. right yeah. Yeah. so we as parents are in um a very painful almost unwinnable situation where the reality is our kids are going to get exposed to foods at birthday parties at school um at girl scouts boy scouts whatever just fill in the blank occasion party uh religious observance grandmother's house whatever right and so um the no sugar no flour rules are not for parents to impose on their kids but there are some rules that are really helpful 
the rules uh, are the division of responsibility. I didn't come up with it. This is Ellen Satter's work, E-L-L-Y-N-S-A-T-T-E-R. Interestingly, if you go to her website, buy her books, just fair warning, she doesn't believe in sugar addiction and she doesn't believe in food addiction at all. I've talked with the woman and she's just saying she's obese. And um, I don't uh, agree with everything she says about adult eating by any stretch, but she has a method for feeding kids that I think is genius. And it has worked so far for me with my own kids and it solves all my nightmares when it comes to feeding kids, not all of them, They're, but you know, it really is the linchpin. So here are the rules, the division of responsibility. You ready? Okay. As parents, we are responsible for when meals happen and what gets served. We are responsible for providing food. And then we become deaf, dumb, and blind, and we let our kids be responsible for whether and how much to eat from what's provided. So we do the providing and they do the eating and we hands off. So that means never commenting on, aren't you gonna eat your vegetables? Take one bite of everything. You have to finish your food, finish everything on your plate. None of that. You provided the meal, they get to eat from what's on the table. And if that means there was, you know, a pot of white rice and there's some butter over there and they're eating nothing but white rice and butter for the meal, fine, their choice. They get to choose, okay? As a parent, your job is to provide meal structure, which is really important for developing brains and bodies. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and kids need snacks too. Parents don't, but kids need a mid-morning snack and a mid-afternoon snack. You don't short order cook, which means you got more than one kid and you're, you're serving whatever. You're not like making a grilled cheese sandwich from, for Sarah because that's all she'll eat. No, no, no. You provide foods that are like foods you feel comfortable serving from lots of different categories, right? Like we're talking like 1950s leave it to beaver meals, right? There's some, you know, vegetable on the table. There's some bread and butter on the table. Some there's some, on some, the some table, Yeah, maybe exactly. Some fruit, sure. so, yeah, exactly. Just think like food from every category and then your job's over, right? Now, if you're doing bright line eating, it's gonna be a lot easier because you're eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're feeding yourself meals with foods from every category. And all you gotta do is throw a big pot of starch on there and put out some bread and butter, and it's like, it's a meal, right? So it's a lot easier if you're doing bright line eating. Um, uh, parents often fall down because they're not eating meals themselves. So how are they gonna feed kids meals, right? They're, they're grazing, catch as catch canning their food all day long from drive throughs and vending machines, and they don't even know where their food's coming, right? So the first rule of thumb is your kids will grow up to eat like you eat. So make sure you're feeding yourself well. Um, yeah, that's how I feed my kids. Love that. I think that's a great way to end the episode, by the way. I, I love that idea that I need to provide the food and I can provide healthy food, but then it's on them. Yeah. And you know they're, they'll develop their own way of eating and I need to lead by example. But I can't, I, and I struggle right now, especially with two and a four-year-old. I'm my yeah. two-year-old; she eats everything, so I'm not worried about her. But my four-year-old, it's like you got to eat this. Well, at least eat this. Well, you got to, and and yeah. it's and it's not enjoyable, no. right? And then yeah. if, if you're, I think that an emotional state matters when you eat as well. Totally. Right. So you that don't want to turn meal times into a battle or an emotional, yeah, battleground. You exactly. don't. Exactly. So. Totally. Totally. Doctor Susan, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, brightlineeating.com is your website. I know you've referenced some other things. You can always go to empoweringyouorganically.com. We will have the transcripts. We will have the show notes. We'll have links to the book and to every other thing that you've mentioned on here. Um, we'll have links to studies. We'll have links to your website. Is there anything else that you want to share before we close off here? Hmm. Yeah, one last thing, because this, this podcast is on sugar addiction, right? I just want a presence, and I just mentioned, you know, the name of someone who doesn't believe in food addiction or sugar addiction, and I want to just presence from a scientific perspective where that debate comes from, because it still is quote unquote debatable in science, whether food addiction or sugar addiction exists, and I just want to clear that up in people's minds. Sugar addiction is real, 
and it's not debatable. The reason that people bicker about it is because we've got a bunch of people who were trained professionally in the treatment for bulimia and, and anorexia for eating disorders to believe that there's no bad foods, that you got to like get over food rules and food exclusions and that the treatment, the way to health for, for someone who's been anorexic or bulimic is to learn to eat all things again. Um, there is not anyone who is a researcher or scientist uh, in the field of addiction who does not believe that sugar addiction is real. You take anybody who studies the brain from an addiction standpoint and ask them, is there such a thing as sugar addiction? And they will look you in the eye and they will say, yes, there is. And I can point, it, point to it on a brain scan. It's right there, right? So that's where the controversy exists, is you've got psychologists who, um, you know, uh, really are clinicians who treat eating disorders, whose who's, uh, skin crawls a little at the thought that we're going to try to tell people not to eat sugar because they want their bulimics and anorexics, anorexics to stop thinking that certain foods are bad. But the reality is that certain foods are problematic for some brains. They really are. They're like heroin, they're like cocaine, they're addictive. And for some people, a, a, an approach of abstinence is going to be more helpful than any other approach. Um, and, you know, I also really believe that different strokes for different folks. Huh, folks, I don't think bright line eating is the solution for everybody. I don't think bright lines for sugar or abstinence for sugar is uh, right for everybody. I'm not looking to get sugar out of our food supply altogether, but I do think that we need to empower people to sort of notice if they're feeling like they're addicted to sugar, it might be that um, not eating cookies is easier than trying to moderate, you know, and eat one cookie because the one cookie experiment never goes well for me or for lots of other people. So I just wanted to clear that up because, you know, a lot of people don't realize that that's where that so-called controversy comes from. It's not controversial. And I'm glad you did. I'm not involved in that conversation much. So I didn't even know to ask that question. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you clearing that up. And I think that if most people look in the mirror and ask themselves honestly, you know, if they have addictive personality, are they addicted to sugar? They likely are. They, they can yeah. look at them like myself, right? And it's the same thing around, I'll just have a few cigarettes as I quit down and I'll just have a few cookies. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so... You can always try giving it up and notice yourself come down with flu-like symptoms and shakes and... <laughs> see what happens. Yeah, see what right? happens. See what happens. Give yep. it up and see what happens. So listen, as with everything that we do on this podcast, it's just to deliver you the information. You're an adult. Uh, make up your own mind. I mean, it, it's not on me to tell you what to do. It's not on Susan or Terry Ann to tell you what to do. It's our job to deliver you the information the best way that we can. And then you, you know, have your own come to Jesus uh, moment and decide yeah. for yourself. Is that an issue for you? Is it not an issue for you? Mm -hmm. What stuff do you want to accept that we talk about? What stuff don't you want to? You're an adult. Um, so do that. And I do encourage you, though, to do the research. Go to brightlineeating.com. Try it. For a little while do your own research and, and don't just make assumptions without trying it and being educated around it so with all that said i'm off my soapbox thank you guys both for being here terry and thank you susan thank you and go to empoweringyouorganically.com for everything podcast related thanks again thanks everyone